Okay, now. Um, this morning we're going to talk about uh, a subject which is um, somewhat esoteric uh, in the sense that not very much is actually said about it. Um, and um, uh, let's let's just preface it by telling the story about what we're going to be talking about. Now, <clears throat> the story is as follows. The story begins uh, with the, it's a story about uh, Elijah the prophet, or Eliyahu. It's a story which is told in Kings 1, chapter 19, actually. <clears throat> Basically, what had happened was that there was um, the uh, king and queen at that particular time were going in the wrong direction, completely the wrong direction. They were very evil people. <clears throat> and um, they had put to death many of the prophets. And Elijah, <coughs> Eliyahu, ran away and escaped. He escaped to a cave in the desert. <clears throat> and... Um, when he's in the cave, uh, just sort of despairing of any um, solution to the uh, to the issue, because the people had seemingly, seemingly had turned against the prophets and uh, were behaving in a way that was, I mean, there were the other prophets were put to death, and he were they were they were searching for him as well. So uh, he was in quite a bad uh, situation. But then he hears a. He hears uh, the voice of God talking to him. In other words, the spirit of prophecy. And this is what and this is what it's really about, essentially, the spirit of prophecy. So he hears this uh, this voice speaking to him, and say, the voice says to him, "What are you doing here, Eli Eliyahu? What are you doing here?" And then um, while he's um, he's basically about to answer, then he's told as follows. Uh, well, he does answer, and then he's told as follows, go out of the cave and stand on the mountain before God. And then there was a very powerful wind that suddenly arose, smashing mountains, breaking rocks. And then the verse says, and God was not in the wind. After the wind came an earthquake, there's actually two, uh, two, um, there are two translations of the word rash. Rash could either mean an earthquake, because an earthquake is, uh, or it could mean noise. Now, earthquakes are usually accompanied by a tremendous noise, but it could just mean a noise without the earthquake. In any event, it was either an earthquake or a noise, a huge noise. And after that, and and uh, he was uh, he became aware that God is not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, earthquake or the noise came a fire, and God was not in the fire. And after that, he heard a call, a small still sound or a small still voice, small quiet voice. The the word the um, the actual terminology is a call de mama daka. Called Mamadaka, small, thin, or still voice or sound. <clears throat> now we have to understand what are these um, things that we're talking about the wind, the noise, or earthquake, and fire. What do they represent? So there's various um, explanations. The Zohar says that these, these three things represent what are called three clipot, three clippers. What are clippers? <clears throat> clippers mean, a clipper means a shell, essentially, a shell. These three clipot, according to the Zohar, are really what are called the klipot hatmeot, the impure shells. Now, let me just explain what this means. 
just as you have uh, a fruit and the fruit is protected by a peel or by a shell, so too in holiness, the inner fruit, the inner quality, the inner content is uh, protected by a shell. Now, sometimes the shell acts as a barrier, sometimes it merely acts as a protection. Let's just take, for example, uh, the difference between, let's say, um, an apple and a, and a nut. <coughs> With an apple, the shell itself is, uh, the peel is essentially edible. It's not something that, um, that, that you have to peel the apple in order to eat it. However, with an almond, let's say, or something like that, a hazelnut, Fulbert, you have to actually crack the shell in order to get there, in order to get to the fruit inside. So similarly, there are more, there's more than one type of, there's more than one type of shell. And in the shells itself, for instance, uh, take example of a peanut. In order to eat a peanut, you have to crack the shell. And then there's a thinner shell inside that one, a red shell that covers the peanut. It's really just a sort of a membrane, a thin, um, possibly also edible, but usually it's removed in order to be able to eat the peanut. That too is an analogy for the idea of the shells, the shells that either prevent one from getting to the inner fruit or simply protect the inner fruit. Now the Zohar explains that the, uh, the shells that are spoken about here, or the klipot, the, the, um, uh, the wind and the noise, the tremendous noise or earthquake and the fire, these are shells that prevent one from getting to the core, from getting to the essence. And they have to be broken through in order to get to the small, still voice. That small, still voice is the voice of, prophet, of prophecy, which I will talk about shortly. <clears throat> now, let's just analyze these three um, uh, these three aspects of clipper of, of of shell. What are they all about? So one of the interpretations of what the shell or the um, the the barrier of wind is all about is that it's the barrier of what is called in Hebrew gava, boastfulness or or um, arrogance. Arrogance or boastfulness. No, like you call a person a windbag. Now, in a windbag, in uh, I think in English, means more someone who uh, like talks too much, too garrulous. He talks too much and he's uh, full of um, full of hot air kind of thing. You know, like uh, like like Washington kind of thing. But um, <laughs> but um, the 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 Zohar explains it more, or com uh, commentaries on the Zohar explain it more, as the idea the idea of um, people who are full of arrogance. They're full of their own airs. They put on airs, so to speak. I think that's the the expression in English. They're full of air. And in order to be able to get to the inner quality, the inner dimension, we have to still go through a number of other uh, iterations, a number, of the, a number of other shells before we can get to the small still voice in the inner content. So the, the, uh, the verse says in the, 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 that um, God was not in the wind. In other words, wind can be a very powerful thing. It can smash rocks. It can smash mountains. It can move things. It's a very powerful force. The force of arrogance, the force of, of, of being full of oneself, can, in with certain people, be a very, very powerful and very, uh, in some cases, even a very motivating, uh, very motivating force. Some people that, uh, that that like to be told what to do, um, and they they accept it. They're 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 into that kind of thing. So. However, that's not where godliness resides. In that mountain smashing, rock smashing force, brute force, the force of the wind, the force of personality, the force of a person's um, arrogance. So then we go to the idea of ra'ash, ra'ash, uh, either noise or earthquake. 
Both of them are described by commentaries on the Zohar. Uh, they're described as a, a lack of feeling of being settled. Someone who's in a state of upheaval. That idea of upheaval, of being uh, constantly being shaken up and, and, uh, and unsteady and um, full of noise rather than silence, that lack of restfulness is another clipper, another shell that has to be broken through in order to get to the inner core. Similarly, the idea of fire, ash, fire, um, is described by, is explained by the commentaries as the idea of anger, of anger, that heat and that, 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 that frustration sort of inflames a person's passions and becomes angry and so on and so forth. So all of those have to be broken through in order to get to the core. In other words, there are three things which prevent one from hearing the voice of the inner still voice. Those three things, again, are arrogance, unsettledness, um, not, being, uh, not being stable and settled, and anger. Those three things have to be broken through. Because in them is not God. Although they are powerful inner forces, nevertheless, those forces cannot be used to, they, 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 they are not vehicles for, uh, for godliness. They're not vehicles for the illumination or the, um, the, the revelation of the Divine Presence. Where is... Um, in this scenario, where is the presence of God found? It's found in the small, still voice. Now, this in itself, this, this, this um, expression, a small, still voice, or called the Mama Daka, is you, that's usually the way that it's explained, a small, still sound, or a small, still, or thin voice. But if you go into the actual uh, linguistics of, the, uh, of these words, it really means uh, something a little bit different. It's a call, it's a sound, but it's the mama, a sound which is doimem, it's silent, daka, and it's a thin or very uh, um, delicate silence, a delicate silence. So what is it? Is it a sound or is it silence? So, some of the explanations or the commentaries going into this um, describe it as both. It is the sound of silence. I think that was actually a song of uh, called Mama. Uh, yeah, let me write it down. Call the Mama Daka. Called the Mamadaka. In Hebrew, that would be Call the Mamadaka. Call the Mamadaka. Okay, so I think there was a uh, Simon and Garfunkel um, um, thing that was called Called the Mamadaka, no? Wasn't there? I mean, uh, Sound of Silence, <laughs> was a song from them called The Sound of Silence or something, no? Yeah, Sound of Silence, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think they got it from here. Um, it's really the sound, that's what, it, that's what it's talking about, it's the sound, the sound of silence. Now, that's like a cute phrase, but what does it mean? So there's a story um, about a certain uh, Hasidic master um, whose name was Rabbi Yitzhak from Vorke. Rabbi Yitzhak Avorke, and his approach to everything was the approach of silence. It was the approach of silence. And one of his contemporaries, a colleague of his, 
um, once went to visit him and uh, he entered his study and I both sat there, he said, we both sat in silence. And he questioned me to my very core, to my very depth. This is what the other person is reporting. He questioned to me to my very depth. And I answered him every question that he, uh, that, he, um, that he asked me until we came to an agreement. <laughs> now, this was all done in silence, you understand? It was all done in silence, the sound of silence. But what's the sound? what is the sound of silence? Usually, when we talk about the idea of speaking, what does speaking try to do? Now, again, we're not talking about um, um, uh, advertisers and politicians and uh, these kinds of people that um, uh, you know make um, make words mean something that they don't really mean, and uh, and so on and so forth. What we're talking about here is. When a person is speaking, he's trying to bring something that's understood in his own mind to the understanding of another person. One doesn't speak to oneself, at least not aloud. I'll get to that in a minute. One speaks in the normal sense of the word, one speaks to other people. When you speak to other people, you want to give them an understanding of something that you are experiencing, or something that you are thinking, an idea, or convey a, an emotion um, in sound, so that the other person can understand. Now, as we know, sound itself is actually linear, because as opposed to vision where vision you're taking the whole picture you can see the whole picture at once even though you don't focus on the whole picture necessarily at once but you do see the whole picture at once whereas sound you can only see things sort of consecutively one sound after the next like some one bite after the next so to speak because if the sounds are all together it's just a noise and it doesn't it's not really it's not sound as such it's just noise <clears throat> and one cancels the other out, and you can't hear anything. So, when it comes to the idea of a small, still voice, or rather, as we said before, when we're talking about call the mama daka, when the silence is speaking, it's a speaking silence, that silence is the silence that's beyond words. Now, what do I mean by that? When a person tries to put his ideas into words, so the idea, the picture that you have in your mind, the idea, let's talk about an idea, not an emotion right now. The idea that you have in order to be able to give it over to somebody else, to convey the idea to somebody else, first of all, it has to be done in a linear fashion. You can't just transfer the picture via some USB port or whatever it is, you know, transfer the picture to someone else's brain. It may be coming somewhere down the line, but right now it doesn't work. Um, so you have to explain it in a linear kind of a fashion, and not only in a linear fashion, but you have to explain it according to the ability of the person who's listening to you to be able to grasp. The story is told about the Ariza Rabbi Yitzhak Luria, the famous Kabbalist from, uh, from Safed Swat in the 1500s, <coughs> who uh, one Sabbath afternoon, one Shabbos afternoon was sleeping, and his eyes uh, were moving, and his student, who happened to see this, he used to, he would he would take a rest for about an hour on, uh, on on Shabbat afternoon. So his student, who saw this, Rabbi Chaim Vital, asked him afterwards, "What was it that you were dreaming about?" He saw his eyes were moving. So I said, "To be able to explain to you would take me eighty years, eighty years, not just eighty years of uh, you know eating and sleeping and drinking and doing everything else that you do, with eighty years ratzuf." Without without a break, eighty years without it would be able. It would take me to explain to you what I saw during during that hour that I was asleep. Now we're talking here about the Arizal, whose ideas are very very lofty and so on and so forth. And to bring them down would be uh, would would take a tremendously long time. But that's the way it is. 
comparably with any thought to be able to bring it into words needs many many more words than the thought the thought itself could be a fleeting idea which only takes a second or two but to be able to explain it could take a very long time relatively speaking maybe 80 years maybe just a few hours maybe even just a few minutes but relative to the thought and the depth of the thought obviously it might have a much longer time to explain it to somebody else so when something comes out in a voice when it comes out in sound it comes out first of all linearly so you don't really see the relationships between one part and the other until you think it through and it also comes out in a reduced fashion the reduced fashion in hebrew is called tzimtzum it comes out with tzum it comes out reduced watered down cut down um compacted it comes out in a sort of much more compact form than it was in your original idea it's a bare bones as opposed to the real the real thing that's what the idea of voice is but the sound of silence is conveying the idea itself now how do you convey the idea itself without words well if we're talking about great uh, saints and saintly people and uh, righteous uh, righteous tzaddikim righteous people they're they're able to do that they're able to convey an idea through the silence the speaking silence the silence that speaks now sometimes um in kabbalah this is referred to as chashmal Hashmal, let me just uh, write it on the board here, on the chat here. Hashmal. Hashmal, or in Hebrew, Hashmal. Which has been, um, uh, the, our sages break it down, and they say that the word Hashmal can mean Hash, and you can break it down into two words, Hash and Mal. Right, or in Hebrew, hash mal. What does hash mal mean? Hash mal means sometimes silent, sometimes speaking. Silence and speech. So it could be that there's silence and there's speech and there's silence and there's speech and there's silence and the speech going between these two poles. But on a deeper level, and, and by the way, this uh, sometimes silence, sometimes speaking is a parallel of what is called Ratzor Vashov, rising and returning, going up and coming back. It's Ratzor Vashov is also part of this, um, th this idea of, uh, of being silent and speaking in a mode of internalization, a mode of externalization. Internalization, silence, externalization, speaking. But there's a higher form of speaking where it is speaking to oneself. There's several, there's several levels of this. The second level is when one speaks to oneself. Now, when you speak to yourself, we don't mean speaking to yourself out loud, which is usually um, not such a good sign in, uh, in most cases <laughs> when you talk to yourself too much. But it means sort of speaking to yourself in an internal way. In other words, sort of analyzing your own thoughts. Uh, in a sense, analyzing one's own thoughts. In other words, Let's say that I want to explain something to, to one of you. A teacher wants to explain something to a student. Before he actually goes to explain to the student, so he thinks to himself how he's going to put this idea into words, before he puts it into words. But he thinks it through for himself as he's going to explain it to the student, but before he explains it to the student. That too is a level of speech it's also a reduction from the original picture but because it's inside me i still have the whole picture even though i'm putting it into uh consecutive frames in order to 
put, give it over afterwards in speech to the student. It's less of a reduction than when it actually comes into speech because it's still in my mind. It's still internalized with me. So that is also a maul. It's also speaking, but it's speaking on a higher level of speech. But then the highest level of silence is ultimately the silence that itself speaks and, 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 and needs, no, um, needs no voice, not an internal voice and not an external voice. It's the silence, it's the silence itself that speaks. In other words, it's the silence of inspiration. Or if you want to put it uh, in a slightly different way, it's the silence, the, the voice of prophecy, which is not my voice. The voice of prophecy, the voice of divine inspiration, is not my voice. My voice is silent. It's the voice that comes from beyond. It's the voice that comes from up above, so to speak. In terms of the Svirot, in terms of the structure of the uh, Svirot, which I really should have up here. One second, let me just... Um, let me just get a picture here to share with you. Hmm, doesn't seem to be here. Um, yeah. Okay, we'll just use this one for now. Okay. One second, folks, while I just um, adjust this. There we go. Okay, can everybody see that? Uh, I'm afraid this one's only in Hebrew, so I didn't think about preparing it beforehand. Um, can you all see it? Okay, this is the tree of the Sefirot. And what we were talking about before, actual speech is associated with Malchut. It's associated with Malchut. Speech is associated with Malchut. That's actually talking things out. Malchut Peh. Torah Shabbat Peh Karina La. Malchut is the mouth. It is the speaking Torah that is described in Kabbalah and in the Zohar and so on and so forth. That's Malchut. The, the, the inside, the internal speech, the internal structure of speech before it comes out in words, before it comes out as a voice, before it comes out as, uh, as, as actual speech, the speech inside, how I'm thinking about a thing in order to present it either to myself or to somebody else. Those are two different levels, but nevertheless, we'll call them one for now. That would be in Bina. That would be in Bina. Bina is also structured. It's analytical. It's analysis. And analysis means putting things in constituent parts, but obviously on a much higher level than speech. It's intellectual analysis. The inner core, the silence itself is in Chochmah. Chochmah is characterized by a state of what is called in Hebrew, Bitul. Bitul means... Um, self-nullification or non-self-existence, let's put it that way. It's not that one's nullifying oneself in the sense of in an active way necessarily, but that one's being is in a state of suspension in a sense. One identifies with that which is beyond oneself. Chochma comes out of nothingness. It emerges from nothingness, and therefore it has the quality of nothingness in it. 
But our sages say, Siyangla Chochma, the fence around, the protection around Chochma, is Shtika, silence. The protection of, of wisdom is silence. Wisdom is protected by silence. That refers to Keter. The ultimate silence is the silence of Keter. In other words, it's a silence because it's certainly not in words and it's not even in thought. Not in analytical thought. That idea of the manifestation of Keter, especially the inner dimensions of Keter, is really the the explanation of the voice of silence, the sound of silence. That's the called the Mama Daka, the small still voice. It's a voice that speaks, but it doesn't speak in words. It doesn't even speak in concepts. It speaks in, if one could use this metaphor, it speaks in light. It's sort of light waves, if you want to, if you want to put it that way. It's something which illuminates from within. It's the silence that illuminates. The other clipot are associated, the, the other uh, ideas that we spoke about before, the wind and the noise or the earthquake and fire, are associated in one way or another with darkness. Silence is associated much more with the idea of light. It's associated with light. It's illumination. Now, obviously not illumination in a, uh, necessarily in a, um, in a physical sense, obviously not. But nevertheless, it can be seen, it can be manifested in a physical way. Like when a person's, um, or rather it can be evidenced, let's put it that way, in a physical way. For, for instance, when a person's face lights up from a sudden revelation that he feels. So his face lights up, like, like that eureka moment when a person... Uh, when, uh, when a person realizes, comes to a certain realization, and usually a transcendent realization, then Chochmas Adam Tayir Panov, his wisdom illuminates his face. A person's wisdom illuminates their face. However, when we're talking about the inner dimensions of Keter, that illumination, that, that inner illumination, is perhaps not even necessarily always recognizable by others. It's the wisdom that is recognizable, the the chokhmah that illuminates his face that's recognizable. Keta that illuminates a person's face is not always necessarily uh, recognizable at the moment it's there. It's sort of a, it's an aura rather than an inner light. Uh, it's a surrounding aura rather than an inner infusion of light. So, <clears throat> when uh, Elijah was being told um, that God is not in the former three, but only in the in the latter, in the small, still, still voice, what was he being told? He was essentially being told that one has to come to that level of inner silence which speaks the inner silence which illuminates, the inner silence which speaks volume is much more than words themselves. And that is um, a process of meditation in during prayers as well. We had spoken before in a previous class about the four stages of prayer, and this in fact is um, explained using these, uh, this, this, this paradigm as well of the four, the Ruach, Ra'ash, Ruach, wind, Ra'ash, noise or, uh, or earthquake, fire, and then silence. These are the four stages of prayer as well. The prayer book is set up, uh, the Hebrew prayer book is set up in such a way that the first stage is um, an emotional arousal. 
the first stage is supposed to bring about an emotional arousal in the sense of Ruach. Ruach also means spirit, to be spirited about things, enthusiasm, right? Ruach. That's the first level. Then, um, that, that is until, for those who are familiar with the prayer book, that is until uh, Baruch Shomar. And from Baruch Shomar to Yishtabach is the idea of, of rash, of, um, of upheaval and noise and moving oneself from where you are to where you ought to be. It's a process of movement and it's an upheaval. By meditating on the things that are spoken about in that part of prayer and, and lost that part of prayer until the prayer Yishtabach. Then comes the fire component, which is all the way through from after Baruch Hu until and including the Shema prayer, which is with tremendous heat and enthusiasm and fire and so on and so forth. Not in the negative sense, anger, but fire, enthusiasm, and 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 wakefulness, and and energy, and so on and so forth. And then eventually, one comes to Shmone Esrei, the silent prayer, the prayer in silence. So one goes through these four stages in order to, or the first, the three stages in order to get to the stage of silence, the standing silent prayer, which is the peak of prayer in. Um, in the Jewish tradition, the standing silent prayer when, when one is in a state of silence. Yes, it's true that there's certain things that we say, but the inner core of it is the core of silence. It's, it's listening more than it's talking. And therefore, um, this is parallel, in, or should be parallel in, in any event, in a person's daily meditation during prayer. And then afterwards, all the rest of the prayer is just bringing that down into reality. Okay, so that's it for today. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer some.